Welcome to this episode of the Zoology Podcast for July. Now, I'm in the UK and it's been unbelievably hot here. I'm talking like 30 degrees, humidity, high as hell. It's been horrible, especially for someone like me. I mean, I'm hot-blooded. I can't deal at all with the heat. It's absolutely terrible. But what's even worse is what high temperature like this can cause and can do to the environment. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the nature of wildfires. A wildfire, also known as a forest fire or a bushfire, is an unplanned, unwanted or uncontrolled fire in an area of combustible vegetation. For instance, within a woodland, a shrubland, or even around a human settlement. Now, forest fires have been getting a lot more press coverage recently, and you may have heard about the 2019 Amazon fires which burnt around 906,000 hectares. That's 2,240,000 acres, or or 3,500 square miles. Or you may have heard about the Australian bushfires in 2020, which burnt approximately 18,636,079 hectares. That's around 46,050,750 46,050,750 acres, or 71,954 square miles. That's equivalent to the entire country of Syria being burnt. For a wildfire to start, you have to have three key ingredients. They are a source of ignition, such as a hot spark, which is in contact with a combustible material, say dry grass or the like, and then you need enough oxygen to supply the fire from the surrounding air. And if you can bring all three forces into play at once, then the ability for a fire to start can arise. The main cause of wildfires depend on the location. In Canada, lightning strikes cause the greatest number of wildfires, while in Australia and the United States of America, many wildfires are caused through human activity, such as throwing away a lit cigarette into dry grass. Now, agriculture doesn't get off light either. Wildfires can be caused by uncontrolled practices, such as slash and burning of land, to convert a wooded habitat into an arable field. In fact, a scary statistic is that in 2019, an estimated 17% of the Amazon's forest has already been converted using these methods. Now, obviously, fires are more likely to start in particular environments. You're unlikely to come across a fire in the ocean, but you are quite more likely to see a forest fire in a dry, dead woodland. Well, this is because environments with a high moisture content do not lend themselves well to the ignition and spread of fire. For a fire to spread, it needs to evaporate any water in the material and heat the material to its fire point. The fire point is the lowest temperature at which the vapour of a fuel will burn for at least 5 seconds after ignition by an open flame. So, it is hard for a fuel to reach its fire point in environments which are shaded, like dense forest. This shaded environment results in lower ambient temperatures and greater humidity, both which reduce the environment's susceptibility to generating a wildfire. Dense forests also produce dense debris, which unlike grasses are harder to ignite because they contain more water and are composed of dense material. The potential for fire to occur comes from when the plant loses more water through evaporation than they can replenish through the soil, humidity or rain, thereby making the plants drier and more flammable over time. The potential for a fire to occur is also affected by both long-term and short-term climate changes. For instance, large amounts of rainfall over a long time period facilitate large-scale plant growth. If precipitation then begins to drastically fall, this results in large amounts of plants drying up and becoming more accessible to being used as a fuel source by any fire. If you then couple this with local heat waves, droughts, climate variation like the water cycle such as the El Nino, and regional weather patterns, for example high pressure ridges, then these can also increase the risk of a wildfire occurring. Once a fire has started, its ability to grow and spread is determined by its surrounding environment. When a wildfire has plentiful, dense and uninterrupted sources of fuel, the fire can spread at a rate of 6.7 miles per hour in forests and up to 14 miles an hour in grasslands. To put that into perspective, the average running speed for a man is around 8 miles per hour. So that is fast enough to outrun a forest fire, but not a grassland fire. If you happen to be an average elite running athlete, then you'll probably be able to sprint at around 15 miles per hour. Even then, you will only likely be able to outrun a grassland fire for a short period of time. But unlike humans who need to break or slow down, the fire can keep going as long as there is enough fuel source. So it's therefore easy to see why wildfires can be such a deadly phenomenon. Actually, running away from a fire might not even let you escape it altogether. Wildfires can spread by jumping, 
This occurs when winds and vertical convection columns carry hot embers known as firebrands through the air. These firebrands can then be taken over roads, rivers or any other kind of barrier. In fact, in Australia, their bushfires produce firebrands which have been known to create new fires as far as 12 miles away from the original source. So you might be running away from one fire and right into the path of another. How bloody terrifying is that? So you can run away from a fire to try to save your own life, but your property can't run away, and many buildings in places such as the USA are made of wood and therefore easily burnt. In fact, in California, the wildfires of 2020 burnt 8,200 structures and displaced more than 53,000 people from their homes. This is bad, however, if we look at the wider scale than just the individual, we can come to appreciate the effects of wildfires on the environment. Forests are basically big, large stores of carbon. When they are burnt, vast amounts of this stored carbon are emitted back into the environment. But when the burnt area regrows vegetation, this vegetation draws carbon back out of the atmosphere and uses it to grow, thereby capturing again the carbon. This is part of the normal fire recovery cycle. However, when burnt areas are unable to recover their vegetation, for example where forests are replaced with agricultural land, the carbon that was released during the last burning is not able to be recaptured and therefore stays in the atmosphere and contributes to climate change. Even in areas that are not converted to farmland and are allowed to recover naturally, the newly burnt area is primed for colonisation by invasive species. For example, cheat grass can grow rapidly in areas damaged by fire, preventing other native species regaining a foothold. This not only assists in changing the type of habitats present, but certain species like cheat grass are highly flammable resulting in the future risk of wildfires occurring and creating a positive feedback loop that increases fire cycle frequency. Frequent fire cycles means more release of sooty particles into the atmosphere, which models predict, and I'm sorry for the weasel word, I actually hate weasel words like this, but could increase absorption of incoming solar radiation during winter months by as much as 15%, which will contribute to climate change. Over the past century, wildfires have accounted for between 20 and 25% of all global carbon emissions. In August 2020, the global carbon emissions of wildfires equaled the average annual emissions of the European Union, which is approximately 2.54 billion metric tonnes. These emissions also contain fine particular matter which are known to cause cardiovascular and respiratory problems. A famous example of this is the smog known to coat industrial cities like those in China which have seen their asthma cases drastically rise. The bad news doesn't end there. Debris and chemical runoff from these fires into watercourses are known to occur after a wildfire. This runoff is known to damage water treatment facilities and make the local water unsafe for consumption. So, this is a zoology podcast. We're meant to be talking about animals. So, in that light, how do animals cope with these conditions? Well, most animals can avoid a wildfire. Birds can fly away, many animals can outrun a fire, especially if it's slow moving, and some animals can retreat underground to avoid the heat and smoke. Wildfires are mostly dangerous to juvenile animals and other animals who are not overly mobile. This doesn't mean that animals are not affected by wildfires, because they really are. The WWF, that's the World Wildlife Fund, estimates that in 2020, the Australian bushfires either killed or displaced up to 3 billion animals. That's right, 3 billion billion animals, of which nearly two and a half billion were reptiles. You can kind of understand this, reptiles being generally smaller can't move as quick as, say, a bird that can fly or a kangaroo that can hop. Okay, so that's all pretty horrid, but they can't all be that bad, right? Well, many animals which graze on grass such as sheep consume any fire's potential fuel source and thereby can actually affect the areas which are prone to wildfires. But if a fire does ravage an area, then predator species can use it as an opportunity to score a quick kill on any fleeing animal. Though this method is mostly available to birds who can quickly escape from a fire's path, but it has been known to take place in animals as large and grounded as polar bears. Once a fire has spread through an area, it can leave many dead trees in its wake. These trees actually attract insects, which in turn attract small birds, which then can attract larger birds. The small birds can also spread the seeds of herbaceous plants, which once grown attract herbivores to the area. These herbivores, such as deer, are attracted to recently burnt areas because they can see further with unobstructed vision, and this means that these areas are actually safer for them to be in, due to them being able to more easily spot predators. 
Okay, so animals have the ability to move out of a wildfire's path, but what about plants? We all know plants don't have the luxury of being able to move like an animal, but what can they do? Well, we have evidence for plants appearing on the Earth's surface beginning around 500 million years ago. Coupled with this, we have evidence from the Welsh borders for wildfires occurring from plant fossils preserved as charcoal from about 420 million years ago. That means we have at least evidence that plants have been in contact with fires for at least 420 million years, and I imagine they've probably had contact since plants first sprouted from the surface of the Earth. Well, this type of contact means that plants have been put under immense evolutionary pressure to adapt to the cycles of fire. For example, plants of the genus Eucalyptus contain flammable oils that encourage fire, yet they also have hard seclerophyll leaves that are heat and drought resistant. This increases their chance of facilitating fires which will then consume their competitors, which allow themselves to dominate their less fire tolerant species within a recovering habitat. But this is only one form of adaptation to wildfires. What other forms of adaptations have current plants evolved? Well, plants use three different strategies to deal with fire cycles. The first is called resistance. This is where the above ground parts of the plant survive the fire. Many species have evolved what's called thick bark. This is a thick outer layer of bark, obviously, which protects the living stem of the plant from direct contact with fire and increases its heat resistance, thereby increasing the plant's chance of surviving a fire. Another resistance method many trees use is called self-pruning branches. This is exactly what it sounds like. The tree will prune off its lower branches as it grows. This reduces the ability for a surface fire to reach the tree's canopy because the fuel ladder is removed. The second strategy is called recovery. This is where plants avoid dying off by sprouting new shoots from structures called epicormic buds, which are located on the trunk, or lignotrumas, which are located below the ground around the root structure. In the event of a fire, plants go through a lot of stress, and it's this stress which triggers the plants to form new shoots from these structures. This evolved method allows plants to quickly recover from a fire after it has occurred. Another method is called colonial spread. This is where buds from a root system turn into shoots and result in all the individuals of one species in one area being developed from a single ancestor. The Californian redwood are a famous example of a species that have evolved this type of recovery method. The final strategy is called recruitment. This is where plant seeds germinate after a fire. This can happen in a number of ways. If a plant is triggered to disperse its seeds after a fire, this is called serotonin. However, in many plants, fire actually stimulates their long-lived soil seed banks to germinate. While in other species, fire stimulates the plants to actually produce flowers, therefore allowing for sexual reproduction. Honestly, I find the fact that these plants have been able to evolve all these methods for dealing with the cycle of fire incredibly fascinating. But overall, wildfires have sounded rather negative and have been such a destructive force that animals and plants have actually had to evolve to cope with their mere presence. But are there any good things about wildfires or using fire in the wild? And how do we actually currently manage these fires in the first place? Well, if a wildfire is raging, we can actually fight fire with fire. By using a fire control method known as backburn, firefighters and woodland managers can use a controlled fire to burn up all the fuel in a designated area. So when the actual forest fire reaches that area, there is no usable fuel, and therefore the fire will die out. Controlled burns can also be used to prevent wildfires. Now, before humans began meddling with nature's fire cycles, natural, low-intensity wildfires occurred occasionally, which would burn up any plant-based fuels, thereby making way for young and healthy vegetation to thrive. This natural cycle is now being replicated by forest managers when appropriate. This creates a low-intensity fire which reduces the chance for high-intensity large-scale fires to happen in the future because all the small sources of fuel have been used up, thereby reducing the amount of fuel accumulation. So we can try to manage small fires so that large fires do not occur, but what happens when they do? How do we manage them then? Well, one of the first things to do is to monitor the spread of the fire. We can do this through the use of drones, planes and helicopters but we can also employ the GPS system and other satellites to monitor wildfires. For example, the European Remote Sensing Satellites, a long-track scanning radiometer, can measure infrared radiation emitted by fires, 
it's able to identify hotspots and fires greater than 39 degrees Celsius. That's 102 degrees Fahrenheit for you Americans out there. Data taken from this system can then be passed through a computer model, which allows scientists to predict how a fire will move based on the weather and the land conditions. And if you can track how a fire is spreading, then you can put measures in place to combat it. The traditional methods used are dropping water or fire retardants on wildfires through the use of planes and helicopters. Fire retardants inhibit combustion through thickening agents and aquarius solutions of ammonium phosphates and ammonium sulfates. They can be spread over an area which is already on fire to help put it out, or in an area in the path of a wildfire as a precautionary method to inhibit the fire's ability to burn that area. Now this sounds all good, but I wouldn't be fair in this podcast without mentioning that despite fire retardants being generally considered not toxic, even slightly toxic compounds when releasing great quantities can be toxic to the humans, animals and plants within the environment. Most fire retardants in the USA are actually not allowed to be dropped within 300 foot of bodies of water due to fire retardants toxicity. Actually, I remember at university reading an article about how fire retardants are a lead cause in the malformation of the genitals of polar bears. But maybe that's a topic for a future podcast. Anyways, back on topic. The good news is that greater than 99% of wildfires identified each year are contained. Except escaped wildfires under extreme weather conditions such as droughts are actually really difficult to suppress without a change in the weather. So, ah. Uh, If only we could control the weather. Well, actually we kind of can. And no, this isn't a conspiracy theory. Silver iodine can be used in a process called cloud seeding. In this process, silver iodine is released into the air from a plane. Silver iodine has a similar molecular structure to ice. This structure encourages water droplets to condense around the silver iodine. And this causes snowflakes to form which then increase the cloud's chance of precipitation. So, we have ways to track and handle wildfires, but you, like I, may have noticed their increased reporting in the news, and so, like me, may be asking yourself, are wildfires becoming more common, and are they getting worse? Well, many things are contributing to our increasing knowledge of wildfire occurrences. The first thing to remember is that a massive fire draws the eyes of people, and obviously, That's irresistible gold for click-starved internet media outlets. But there are also more grounded causes of why we may be seeing more and more fires, and unfortunately they all seem in some way to be related to human activity. In the United States, the use of wildfire suppression with the aim of minimalizing fire occurrence has actually contributed to the accumulation of fuel. This obviously increases the risk of large catastrophic fires because more fuel is present. Luckily though, as we have covered, modern fire management is learning from natural ecological processes and have begun using controlled burns to mitigate this risk and promote natural forest fire cycles. People are also introducing invasive species such as the eucalyptus tree it's covered earlier, which increase the chances of wildfires occurring. And then we reach what people are doing in the Amazon. Increased logging, cattle ranching practices and slash and burn agriculture all damage or replace the fire-resistant rainforests and instead promote the growth of more flammable habitats, such as grasslands, which create a cycle that encourages more burning. When you couple this with increased amount of drought and the loss of replaced forests, meaning more carbon is released in the atmosphere, then the chance of wildfires to occur just keep increasing. And this doesn't sound good at all. In fact, a study by Pierce and others in 2004 conducted on all uvial sediment deposits going back over 8,000 years found that warmer periods of climate experienced more severe droughts and fires. They concluded that the climate is a powerful influence on wildfire cycles, and that trying to recreate a pre-human settlement vegetation structure is likely to be impossible in an ever-warming future. Well, all of this doesn't sound too good. We may have the ability to fight wildfires, and we're lucky that most wildfires do not get very large in the first place. But still, a warming climate is likely to result in more and more wildfires, and this is likely to affect humans and wildlife more and more. It's good that we are learning from nature in how to manage these fires, because boy, in the future we may need to implement these methods to a much greater extent. But for now, I guess all we can do is learn, prepare, and steal ourselves for the burdens which will be placed on all of our shoulders. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Zoology Podcast. 
And if you're like me, you're hoping that the uh, temperature cools down just a little. 